Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Vojkovic family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Fall in love with autumn with PJ's new seasonal lattes. Our pumpkin latte brings you all the flavors of a pumpkin pie with hints of cinnamon and nutmeg, like your favorite holiday dessert in a cup. And our s'mores latte with flavors of toasted marshmallows, warm milk chocolate, and graham cracker cinnamon is sure to bring back campfire memories. The PJ's Fall Seasonal Lattes, available at your local PJ's only for a limited time. Bottom line. Well, it's funny that you say that. Good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports. Hey, I'm your host Scott Alexander. We have another great show for you today. I cannot wait. I hope everybody is staying cool with all the hot weather we've been having. And I hope everybody has a very safe Memorial Day weekend coming up. Obviously, Friday, Saturday and Sunday and Monday is Memorial Day. So have fun with that. But the NBA playoffs, the conference finals are in full swing right now. I've got to say this LeBron and the Cleveland Cavaliers looked like they were going to be dead. They were down 2-0 in the series, and they got shellacked both games. They, but i got to tell you, they, they tied the series up. The home teams are now 4-0. Last night, LeBron had his seventh, seventh, 40-plus point playoff game against the Celtics in his career. And get this, that was his 22nd time in the playoffs against the Celtics that he scored at least 30 points. He is coming through when they need him most. They never had gone down 3-1 in a series, except for that time they came back and beat the Golden State Warriors. They did not want to do it again. So right now the season, the, the series is tied up. We'll see how it goes in Boston. If Boston can continue that home court dominance, they certainly can't do it on the road. The other one, well, I used the word shellacked again. I'm going to say it right here because Golden State, they absolutely shellacked the, the Houston Rockets. That's right, the 65-win Houston Rockets. Uh, they lost by 41 points in this game. Steph Curry, who'd been a bit quiet the first two games, well, he was on fire in this when he had 35 points. And when he got on a roll, he just took it to the town. He, obviously, we all saw what he did. Uh, he, he let them know whose house it was after one of his great shots, but he was on a roll. And when he does that, he looks like he's becoming the guy he was before his injury. We'll see. The Rockets trail 2-1 to one in the series, but it feels a lot bigger. Uh, tonight's game kind of feels like it's a do-or-die situation. If they lose, go down 3-1 to the Warriors. Winning three against that team is going to be next to impossible. Hey, good news, however, for the Rockets is that the Warriors' best defensive player, their specialist, Andre Iguodala, will be sitting this game out tonight. He's got a swollen knee. It's not like he's one of their big four, but he's certainly an important piece to that team. So if that gives them a little glimmer of hope, that's it right there. Hey, by the way, we also have some rare hockey news here. There's no ice in New Orleans, so we rarely talk hockey, but you have to give the Las Vegas Golden Knights their credit. It has been unbelievable. They're an expansion team. I remember back when I was a kid when the New Orleans Jazz were an expansion team in New Orleans. They won 23 games and lost 59, and that was the best expansion record ever up to that point. Well, this team right here is going to the Stanley Cup Finals in their very first year of existence. Now, that is simply remarkable. The Knights' opponent... Well, it's going to be the winner of this Tampa Bay Lightning Washington Capitals series, and that's the team I'm rooting for, the Caps. I lived in D.C. for four years right out of college, the first hockey experience I ever had, so I'm hoping that they get it through. They stayed alive last night. They had a big 3 nothing win to force a game seven, and here's the question. Will superstar and left wing Alexander Ovechkin, who you see right there, will he get his first chance at a Stanley Cup final? I am very hopeful. Game seven tomorrow in Tampa. Now on to football. This is what everybody here in New Orleans and South Louisiana loves. The Saints OTA started today. And I have absolutely no information on what happened because the media is not allowed in until Thursday's practice. But what I do know is that the Saints have kind of become Ohio State Buckeye South. 
This team last year, the Houdats had four great players from Columbus. Marshawn Lattimore, the Rookie of the Year. Michael Thomas, the great second-year player last year, now going into his third. Veteran Ted Ginn had a really nice season. And now third-year player Von Bell looks like he's going to be a big part of this defensive secondary because of the absence of, uh, obviously, Vaccaro. But by the way, they've also added two more of Buckeyes to make it six. And one of them is veteran Kirk Coleman, who we've talked about before. He's a safety from the Panthers. He's going to be in that rotation out there with Marcus Williams, of course, and Von Bell, who I just mentioned. Great player. And they have rookie undrafted free agent JT Barrett, who, all, by the way, was a three-time first-team All-Big Ten player. He has the most career yards and the most career TDs in, in Big Ten history. That's remarkable. He'll get an opportunity. Whether it's quarterback, they're going to give him a first shot there. Tremendous athlete, tremendous young man, so we'll – See what happens. Speaking of Ohio State, how about this one? Highly regarded Buckeye quarterback Joe Burrow officially transferred to LSU this weekend. It was down to North Carolina, Cincinnati. He's from that area. And LSU, he picked LSU, signed the scholarship papers yesterday. Burrow would have probably actually started at Ohio State, but he had a broken hand, which dropped him down the depth chart a good bit. But make no mistake about it, this kid is a stud. He threw 157 touchdowns in high school. He's got that it factor. But you know what? Where does this leave this LSU quarterback situation? It's going to be interesting because you have two guys you see right there, Miles Brennan, Lowell Narcisse. They were highly regarded coming out. Maybe their progress isn't what Coach Ogeron expected, but, you know, one of them might transfer. A lot of you get more that Narcisse might be on the right way out. Who knows if it's Tulane or somebody else, but I love the kid. I hope he stays, and I hope there's a nice quarterback competition. Don't forget vet Justin McMillan, the only veteran on this group. Well, he looked good in the spring game, so right now there's four. I can't promise by the end of the week how many is going to be at LSU, but it's going to be interesting. Also on the football front, it looks like New Orleans is finally going to get another Super Bowl. Hey, the last one was in 2013 for the 12th season. That was Super Bowl 47. Remember that one when the Ravens beat Colin Kaepernick and the 49ers and the lights went out? Well, 11 years later, they're finally going to get another one. This one's going to be Super Bowl 58 in 2024. It's not done yet, but it should be confirmed tomorrow. And that's good news because I was a kid. It seemed like the Super Bowl in New Orleans is every third year. Uh, and these days it's taken basically a decade each. Hey, oh, by the way, the Preakness Stakes was this weekend. You know, I'm a big horse guy. I love it. And for the second straight big race, the Kentucky Derby first in this one, the track was extremely wet, extremely soggy and very foggy as well. And justify. The horse who won the Kentucky Derby on another wet track won again. The biggest thing were the three horses that were right behind him. Those horses were basically in a virtual tie for second place, all edged each other out by a nose, so exactas were lost and won on the very last part of that race. Hall of Fame jockey Mike Smith, who you see right there, he was tremendous yet again. And I can't say enough about Hall of Fame trainer Bob Baffert who won his seventh Preakness. That is remarkable. In fact, all five of Baffert's Kentucky Derby wins that same horse has also won the Preakness, but only one of his horses went on to win the Triple Crown and win the Belmont. That, of course, was American Pharaoh three years ago. That tremendous horse did it for the first time. There's only been one in 40 years, and that was Baffert's American Pharaoh. He says justify is even better. We shall see. The Belmont will tell the tale because that is a long race, and it's usually one that people that have those fast horses don't always fare well in the long race track by the way hey by the way it was a tough week in the sporting world this week i have to say lots of death for some very very talented folks and, and guys that have left the mark on sports not just in south louisiana and uh, pretty much across the country the first one is some say the greatest tiger ever as you know billy cannon passed away at the age of 80 on sunday morning he, he died in his sleep the 1958 national champion with head coach paul dietzel well, he was a legend. I mean, this guy was the Heisman Trophy winner in 1959. He was one of only six players in SEC history who was a two-time player of the year in that conference. And by the way, I remember being in college in the 80s. In 87 and 88, they were filming a movie that seemed like everybody was around. All my friends were extras in that movie at the game, but it was Dennis Quaid. Basically, loosely based on the life of Billy Cannon. And it, he was called the Great Ghost in this movie. And it was great. Jessica Lange, John Goodman, and Timothy Hudson. It was a great, great movie. I loved it. And that was filmed in Baton Rouge. So that was a lot of fun. Also, moving forward, uh, Billy Brewer passed away. The Ole Miss legendary coach, Billy Brewer, uh, coached for a long time at Ole Miss. He was a player there as well. 
and he will certainly be missed. And right after him was Mike Slive, the former SEC commissioner who I used to work with pretty closely when I was at Fox Sports in Atlanta. We, we were before the SEC network was formed. We were basically the station for the SEC back then. And he actually was the guy that got the SEC network formed, and he's done some great things for the conference following up Roy Kramer. By the way, Brett Barrett, a very close friend, very close. He's the ultimate NBA power broker. He was on the first McDonald's All-American team back in 1980, played at Kentucky, as you see right there. Uh, he had to play with some superstars. Sam Bowie, who was picked ahead of Michael Jordan, was one of the other big guys. Melvin Turpin was a superstar big man on that team and Jim Masters, so he ended up starting finally in his senior year, but that's not what he's known for. This guy has been so influential as a financial consultant. He, then, he did some agent work as well. He's a lawyer, but he, like I said, the ultimate NBA power broker uh, on all levels of basketball, and he's been the chief consultant for Stan Kroenke, the owner of the Denver Nuggets, the, the Los Angeles Rams, the Colorado Avalanche, and the Arsenal in the English Premier League. So he was only 56 years old. That's a sad day. Also, I got to say, LSU baseball, they are playing as we speak right now, pretty much in a do or die game, in my opinion. They have to beat Mississippi State to advance, and I think that will guarantee them a spot in the NCAA region, and we shall see. They are the AC. Tulane, well, they played this morning as of tape time. I don't know what's happened. They played Houston, we shall see. And UNO is in the Southland Conference. They play Sam Houston State at 4 p.m. Wednesday. Southeastern Nichols, they'll, they'll square off tomorrow at noon. We do a lot with them. Also in that conference, you got McNeese is playing Northwestern. So that's all Southland stuff. And also in the Sun Belt, you have the UL Raging Cajuns. They have a bye. And hopefully they can get through and get that automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. I know Southeastern is looking for that same thing. And Louisiana Tech, will they play Rice tomorrow at 1230. So that's all your news. I have Zach Streif on this show today. I cannot wait. He is a longtime veteran, obviously, with the New Orleans Saints. One of those rare double-digit uh, NFL players that stay with the same team, very much beloved in this city. And now he's the beer man with uh, Port Orleans Beer over there in Chapatulas. They have a great thing going on. We're also going to have David Grubb on this show. We're going to talk a ton about the Pelicans, what's their future, Boogie, uh, how about the NBA playoffs, and we'll get into some football with him as well. And I've got a couple musicians, a couple guys that were in my former house band here. We're going to get an update. they got a new album coming out. It's James Martin and Derek Freeman. They're in a few bands together, one that everybody knows is Soul Brass Band. So we got a great show for you. Stay tuned right here on Primetime Sports. I hear the train a coming, it's rolling round the bend, and I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. I'm stuck in Folsom Prison. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. I just got finished telling you in the open, my very first guest is going to be a guy that played with the New Orleans Saints for 12 years. Offensive lineman Zach Streif, Northwestern grad. He obviously uh, he's from the Midwest. He went to Milford High School for the, the Eagles, not the Golden Eagles. And then he's been in New Orleans, and he's got roots down here. He's now doing a lot of media, some stuff with WWL. He did a draft show with uh, Deuce McAllister and some other folks. Mike Dettilia, I listened to that. And he's also a big part of a beer company. We'll talk about that. It's called Port Orleans on Chapatulas. And by the way, if you haven't seen this thing, it is magnificent. But here he is right here for the first time. Zach Streep, what's up, my man? Thank you for having me, Scott. I appreciate it. So now I get to ask you the questions. That's right. That's you were on a radio show. Role reversal for role us. Role reversal. Yeah. He's been filling in a lot of WWL, yep. and you were asking me a lot of Boogie uh, Cousins questions. Yep. Uh, what was the consensus after that show, not about my interview, but just in general about Boogie? Should he stay or should he go? Well, I think, you know, in New Orleans, I think this is our, this may be the best opportunity we ever have right. to feel those types of you know, to have the big three, which seems to be the thing in the NBA now is to really have this. The big three, this, yeah. The, the big three. And so, you know, I don't think that, I don't know that New Orleans will ever have an opportunity, obviously with Anthony Davis being a kind of a generational talent and to have a chance to pair a guy like Boogie right now. I don't know if we'll, never ha if we'll ever have a better chance to do it. So hopefully we can, we can keep him here. Well, it's funny. I, you're, bringing, you're making me think about something because you were here in 08, and they had a great team. They got, to, they got even a little further in the second round, almost got to the conference finals. But this team, I think, has a lot more upside. And what I do notice from my years in Atlanta and being around the NBA with TNT that uh, 
Football players are uh, at basketball games a lot. I yep. mean, because a lot of them play basketball as well. But I have not, I've noticed that basketball players aren't in the stands at football games very often. Right. <laughs> but did you go to a lot of games when you first moved here? Yeah, actually, I had season tickets uh, to the – to the, Pelic, to the Hornets at the right. time, yeah. Um, for my first couple years in the league, there was three or four of us that would split them up. Jeff Fain and Rob Petiti, friends yeah. of mine, we just kind of grabbed a couple and, and we would split them up. So we went a lot, and I think you're right. I think there's a lot of football players that played in high school. Uh, certainly a game that I loved in high school. Um, now, I will say this. There's more Pelicans players than you realize at football games. It's just you much harder them. to find it's them in the crowd. It's harder to find them. They're true story. So, yeah, That's a good point. A lot of times uh, they'll be on the sideline like right before half. You know what? You're and right. So You're I've right. done a lot of like real high fives with uh, Anthony Davis. You are and, right. And Boogie was there. So they, they do get out there, but it's, it's harder to find them in the day. I just remember in Atlanta, Michael Vick was like uh, – he, he seemed to be at every basketball game. And yeah. I was like, I guess the Hawks weren't going there. i got to ask you, New Orleans, this is interesting because you got drafted with that great draft class of 06, and you were – Right after Katrina, well, honestly, when you saw your name being pulled up, and you're obviously the excitement of hearing your name called has got to be one thing, but then you see it's New Orleans. What was your first reaction? Well, my initial reaction was excitement, like you said. Like you, you don't you don't process the whole thing, at, you know, at once. Uh, after it had kind of died down, there was really two things that came to mind. One was. That was the one team that I met with that I walked away saying, and really it was just with the <laughs> offensive line coach, that I walked away saying, no there's way. No, no way way. I'm going to end up That's there. That hilarious. Guy, that guy hates me. <laughs> what happened? What happened uh, in the interview? The first thing that, so Doug Marone, who's now the coach yeah. of the Jacksonville yeah. Jaguars, was the offensive uh, line coach and the offensive coordinator uh, the first, my first year here. And we sit down, I sit down with Doug, and I sit at the, at the table, we shake hands, he sits down, and he says, I've seen all your film, you're terrible. <laughs> That's the first thing that he says to me and uh, proceeded to pretty much just shoot holes in everything that I'd ever I love done Doug as an Marone. athlete. This is funny because I knew him in Atlanta because when he coached yeah. college in, in Georgia. And listen, and I love Doug, and he was a fantastic coach to start with in the NFL. That's funny. But he pretty much tore me apart. And I think for Doug, it was a way to see, okay, let's see how, you know, you got a guy from Northwestern, guys that come out of Northwestern, there's a perception that you're, you're too smart and you're maybe from too – upper class of a family and maybe you know it's like it's not you're not tough in Natchitoches people right. it's northwestern in Evanston Illinois outside Chicago yeah. so a little I, different I think I think the play there by Doug was let's see if this kid is tough enough to deal with real adversity how did you deal with it man well I, listen I answered the questions and I you know <laughs> there's always there's these standard answers you know you're terrible well I know I have a lot to work on uh you know and I'm looking forward to improving you know with the coaching at the next level well you know you, you you're too slow to play tackle you know, I, I believe that you can find ways to, to make blocks, whether you have the physical attributes or not, and I'm willing to work hard to make. You know, you, right, it's like right. you no, almost, no. you, you yeah. just kind of play the I, game with them. And, and I think and he's playing he, the game with you. He's playing it with me. And so <laughs> right. I think at the end of the day, you know, what you don't want to do is get mad or, or fight back or, you know, I think that's how I played anyways. I'm sure some guys say, well, I think you're a terrible coach. And, you know, that's the end of getting drafted by the Saints. So uh, it worked out well, obviously, uh, because, you know, I ended up here. All right, I remember that vividly because I happened to be in town from Atlanta that day, the, that draft. And back then, they didn't have the Thursday night thing yet because I remember when Reggie Bush was picked first in your draft, it was, I was at the Jazz Fest. I do remember that vividly. And I remember everybody, they put a loudspeaker thing, and everybody went nuts because they thought he might go first to the Texans. They ended up taking Mario uh, Williams, Williams, I guess. Yeah. So long story short is, at the end of this draft, and you guys go to the rookie camp, because this thing, other than maybe 1981, and you could, you could argue 06, 81, and now 17, those are easily the three best drafts in Saints history. Right. But when you saw guys like Marcus Colson, who was picked after you in the seventh round, y'all were both seventh rounders, yep. obviously, you know, you had Roman Harper, you had Jari Evans, uh, you had obviously the first pick, Reggie Bush, et cetera, Rob Nikovich, too. Um, did y'all have any inkling how good all of you would become? I would probably say it was the opposite. I mean, you know, we had Reggie, and obviously at that point, people forget Reggie Bush might have been the biggest sports celebrity yes, in the yeah. in the world. At the, I mean, he was massive. So obviously, I mean, most of us were excited to meet Reggie Bush. <laughs> exactly. You know, right, right. Uh, but you look past there. You know, Roman Harper was kind of well regarded. We bring in a guy from Bloomsburg that wore Rex Specs. We didn't, you know, what what was that all about? Right, right. Uh, right. We bring in this this no, defensive about end, Jari Evans. Jari right, Evans, right, yeah. Sure. We bring in, uh, you know, uh, Rob Nikovich, who I'd played against in college, and I felt like I just destroyed Rob. At I couldn't Pitt, believe. Right? Yeah, he yeah. was. At, no, he's at Purdue. Oh, 
Purdue, Purdue, Purdue. Purdue uh, right. And then, you know, Colston has had back problems and he couldn't run and he was too big and I was too unathletic to play in the, I mean, it's like, no, that there was no perception early. Now, once we got in through training camp, uh, I think it became evident that we had some players, you know, I think we had four guys starting on opening day from that class. And then, uh, I mean, that's remarkable, isn't and, it? I yeah. Mean, and really, when you think about it, I think what was most remarkable about that class was not the immediate impact. It was the long range. Impact. Super Bowl so, starters. I mean, I mean, a lot of players. Super Bowl starters. We had six players that played over 10 years. That's um, remarkable. And so I think, and, and really what's, you know, really to me, most, most remarkable is four of those players were after with a fourth round or later. And so it wasn't like we had, you know, four number threes and two number twos and a no, number one at all. Uh, so, yeah, I think that was really, you know, that that draft class built a foundation here. And I think built a, uh, a type of player that the Saints have looked for to this day. Now, Marcus Colson, arguably one of the greatest receivers, if not the best in Saints history, he's certainly one of the top three. But I had Ricky Jackson on my very first show and I talked about that very topic. And he's like, no way. 81's much better. They're good. Yeah. They're second. But right. we're number one. Yeah. Ricky's not going to give you any credit. Yeah. But by the way, what happened to the other two guys? Mike Hass from Oregon State, the wide receiver, and defensive back Josh Lay from uh, Pitt, I believe. Yeah. I think that's so, the pick guy. So Mike Haas was a guy they really liked. Mike Haas actually led the NCAA in receptions the year before. Yeah. Went to Oregon State. Uh, had a good camp. They they tried to put him on practice squad. They want him on practice squad, and I think he was offended oh, right. and ended up going to Chicago and being put on their practice squad. <laughs> and I think if you, you look back as, on your as an squad. offensive player, right. you're looking back going, man, I really should have stuck around. Because, Sean Payton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and Josh Lay, I don't believe, ever had another opportunity. I think he kind of fizzled out in the, uh, in the preseason. So, uh, you know, it wasn't perfect, but, you know, and it, Again, the longevity of that class, um, I don't believe has ever been done before. I don't think there's ever been six guys in one class make it 10 years. And that's really, I think, what set that class up. All right, apart. I have three pictures I want to show you. And they're all, I want you to look at them individually and say, what were you thinking right when this happened? Here's the first okay. one. There's big J.J. Watt, who is oh, one of the most powerful great. guys. But y'all are both on your stomach. And Drew Brees is like, and it looks like he's looking at you like he's going to maybe say something. You have any idea what happened here? Uh, I do not know what happened there. I do know that was not a sack. Right, right. So, I knew that. Because I didn't give up a sack in that game. Um, I just wanted to think, did he say anything to you? Uh, he said he says stuff every play. All right. Yeah. What about the next one? This is funny because you're is, airborne. This is a traumatic moment for me <laughs> right, in my career. Here? So this was, uh, you know, I, I was an eligible receiver uh, as a tight end for five years. And this was the pass that was thrown uh, to me. We were oh, playing, we were playing okay. the Pittsburgh Steelers on Halloween night. It was Sunday Night Football, national I television. The game. I, was, I remember and, watching that one. Uh, yeah. It was basically a pop pass, so I was supposed to block uh, Lamar Woodley for a three count and then release. And as I released, he held on to my neck rolls or to, to my shoulder pads, and so he spun me around ah. and drew through the ball. And it, the, you hear, there's two camps. There's I dropped it, and that Drew overthrew me. Neither one of them really happened. I was falling. Drew had someone in his face. He couldn't throw it down to me, and so that photo I had was... no idea you were going to jump on it so fast because I just thought it was a random picture. Nah. But, okay, the third one. Um, yeah. The only reason I'm saying this because Von Miller is obviously at the top of his game, and when this dude is coming at anyone, they have to be a little scared. So tell me what's going on right well, here. Well, for one, I appreciate you putting one photo on of me doing something well, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> no. um, so, so listen, Von Miller, th this, this game's from uh, 2016. Yeah. And uh, the, you know, the extra point situation. Yes, right. the return extra point. Von's an, a tremendous football player, a really talented guy. Um, this, for me, was a really big game personally. I felt like in my career in general, I played my best against the best guys. And this, for me, was a memorable game. Uh, I did give up a hit in the two minute drill late in the game. Uh, but pretty much shut Vaughn out. I he did. Think, I think he, did. he had a couple tackles, um, and I played very well in that game, and it was a really big moment for me. And he did. He came up to me after the game and said, you're still good. You're still he good. He said, you're old, but you're, you're still, still good. good. And, uh, Does he that, chatter that, a little bit, too? No, Vaughn's bon, pretty quiet. Act, yeah, okay. yeah I, re I, I, like, I respect Vaughn a lot. Uh, he's a good football player, and, and that, was a, uh, that was a tough loss for us because – uh, I think we deserve to win that one. If you Google your name and put images, I got to tell you, at least half of them, this is true, so, are with Drew Brees. Yeah. You two obviously seem to have a special relationship, and I've got a ton of shots of y'all just having fun together. This is an anthem one, but lots of fun. Talk about your relationship with Drew. Yeah, you know, I think anyone that's played for a, a place for a long period of time with Drew uh, is going to have a special uh, adoration for him. He's, he's such a unique 
uh, not only player, but, but guy. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of moments in my career where uh, maybe you have questions about, you know, am I doing enough or am I, am I, and it was like there was never doubts in Drew's mind. Uh, not when I was a backup that was going to come in and play, Drew changed nothing. Everything was, I trust Zach, I believe in Zach. And as a young player, that means a ton to you. Uh, as an older player, um, as we got an opportunity to know each other more personally, I think you appreciate more and more as you go the amount of sacrifices that he makes to be what he is. It's really amazing. It really is. And yeah. as a player, especially as an offensive lineman, his preparation makes us all look better. Yes. And so, you know, you wonder, you know, I was fortunate to play 12 years. Would I have played 12 without him? And, and I don't know the answer to that, but I would, I'd venture to say no. And so I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And now that everyone's seen me cry about your it, so. grades from 2011 to 16 are some of the very best in the NFL. I mean, really some of the best. You have to take pride. And by the way, that I'm going to combine this question with the fact that double digit careers with the same team, double digit years is so rare these days. You played 12. Talk about how important that was for you to do that. Yeah, it was. There's really one thing as a young player. Coach Payton told me uh, he had called my coach in college, Randy Walker, who gave Sean his first offensive coordinator job at Miami of Ohio. And he called Randy before the draft to ask about our quarterback. And Randy said, just before we get off the phone, there's this guy, my ta I have a tackle, he'll play for you for 10 years. Wow. <laughs> and Sean told me in the seventh round, you're throwing darts at the wall. You right. know, you, you yeah. don't, you don't. No doubt. And so he said, you know, Randy never complimented anybody. And so I said, I I'll trust that opinion. And so to me, uh, Coach Walker passed away right after I was drafted. Wow, wow. And to okay. me, my whole career was very important to make that statement true. And you made it true, dude. And I made it true. And so, you know, as I got later in my career, I think my love for the city and the organization was always going to overweigh any amount of financial gain I could find outside of, of New Orleans. So, uh, you know, for me, it was about staying uh, loyal to the, to the team that gave me a shot because obviously everybody passed on me a bunch. And there was only one team that was willing to, to you know, to, to put their faith in me. And so it was important to me throughout my career to kind of pay that back. I'm going to ask you about two tackles. One of them, you got hurt in the preseason last year? I got hurt camp? in the first game uh, in the second quarter and then got hurt my first game back in the second quarter. Both rolled up. Okay, because Ryan Ramchek, there's a guy who ultimately took your place and played every down last season, which yes. is like, Remarkable to me, particularly for a rookie. Yes. You kind of became a mentor to him. I didn't say kind of. You were a mentor to him. And now I noticed that you were at the rookie camp with a guy that was on our show two days before he was drafted, Will Clapp, mm -hmm. who was a seventh rounder like yourself, who's wearing your number. Talk about what you did to help Ryan Ramchek have that great rookie season and what you're doing in, in talking to Will Clapp as well. Well, for one, Ryan's coaches at Wisconsin deserve a whole lot of credit. Um, he was as NFL ready of an offensive lineman as I've ever been around. And he was a, a late bloomer too. I mean, he's well, a, listen, Ryan has a really interesting story. It's amazing. Uh, he started at a D2 school, uh, was going to stop playing football completely, Be transferred to Wisconsin for one season, played every game his senior year, got hurt, uh, you know, missed all of the pre-combine stuff, which is why he slid, I think, so far. So he's got an interesting backstory, but – uh, Ryan is a, he's a sponge. He, he wants information. Uh, he's excellent at taking words and putting them into physical actions, which some guys really struggle with. Um, but at the end of the day, he's got tremendous tools. He's a really good athlete. He's a strong kid. He's got a good, he's got good feet. He's smart. He's got every attribute you want. And I, I think you couldn't explain how impressive his rookie season was. No, it's it, amazing. It was really tremendous. I mean, every down, and he played it very well. Yeah. Hey, by the way, Will Clapp, brother Martin kid, local guy, LSU guy, just a tremendous human being. His dad, Tommy, as well, played at LSU. Uh, you were there. You seemed to be talking to him. I mean, I wasn't able to go, but tell me about uh, getting to know him. Yeah, you know, I, I talked to Dan Rochard, the offensive line coach, the night before, and just kind of had texted him to see how the young guys were doing. And, and Dan called me when he was driving home on the bridge, and we talked for 30 minutes about everyone. And, and you know, he said, hey, why don't you stop in sometime? And so I went to the field. I, I really, in my head, I said, well, this is perfect because there won't be any media at rookie minicamp, and then I won't have to answer <laughs> questions about whether I'm going to be a coach for the next three right, weeks. Right, and right. then there was media at rookie minicamp. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and, I, and I am answering those <laughs> right, questions. Right. But no, I went over to, to meet those guys and, and got an opportunity to, to meet Will and, and Rick uh, and all the young guys. And 
For me, it's, you know, listen, I don't want to coach because I, I respect how much those guys work. I just don't want to do it. Right, right. Um, you know, the amount of hours they put in to put our, a team on the field is tremendous. And, uh, but I do want to be involved, and I love working with younger guys. And so, you know, Coach Payton has essentially told me you have an all-access pass. So uh, I've had an opportunity. You know, if, when I get a chance to go in, I'm going to go in and help those guys. All right, in closing, this leads me to the next thing because what is the next step for you? You are part owner, I'm assuming, of Port Orleans, yes. which, by the way, I'm going to say this again. If you have not seen this place, it's the nicest brewery I've ever been to. Maybe there's a couple in Colorado that look like it that I've been to, but well, this place on Chapatulas, yes. spared no expense. This is like phenomenal. The inside, you're like, wow, it's incredible. So you got to get over there. Talk about what you're doing there. And you, by the way, you mentioned talking to the media. You are kind of media a little bit, yeah. at least for now. Tell us what you're doing. So first of all, Port Orleans, uh, listen, we, we really wanted to create a, a venue that New Orleans didn't have yet. And uh, we wanted it to be the premier craft brewery in the state of Louisiana. And, uh, you know, we did. We put a lot of money into it. But what we really wanted was to create a place uh, that we could create jobs in the city of New Orleans. That right. was really important to me as I left. I wanted right. to get involved in something that was a job creator. It's, a, it's an ascending industry in New Orleans. We're a little bit behind everybody else. Um, and so it's a really good place for growth. And I've had a blast with it. Uh, I've been probably more involved than I had anticipated on being uh, initially, but I've had a blast and, uh, you know, we continue to grow. Um, so that's been a lot of fun and it takes up a good amount of time. And then the media side of it, uh, what I've really done is not said no. I, you know, it's right. like if, if someone calls there you are and right says, there at the draft show with Deuce, yeah, might the draft Tillier. show. Uh, Maybe Christian was involved. I don't know. Yeah. And, and it's been a lot of fun. And I'll I tell you, WWL has given me a, a bunch of opportunities to do pretty much whatever. They've let me host shows. They've let me be an analyst on shows. I've done some work with the Saints on the draft. Um, really what I'm doing is trying to figure out what it is I want right, to do. Exactly. Because I've never right. been on your side before. Right. And, uh, you know, the, it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. And, you know, we'll kind of see what comes of it. Uh, but right now it's kind of let's just do everything and not say no and tr e take every opportunity that I get. And then, you know, once I get them all, I can sit back and say, okay, well, what did I love doing? Because, you know, what I want to do and what I feel like I'm fortunate to be able to do is pick the thing that I really enjoy and I really love doing. Well, the next time you bring your beautiful wife from the North Shore over to your condo in the warehouse district, uh, there's a great restaurant on Maple Street. It's part of Delachey's family on St. Charles. Okay. This is Shay's Delachey's. You can use a Delachey's. Too, awesome. No, it's on we, Maple between Carrollton and Broadway uptown. I'll tell you, it's one of my wife's favorite places. The UN. So this is perfect. It's we perfect. We will for sure use it. And we have a brand new ball from last week. I, I usually don't put basketball guys, but the Saints are part of the Pelicans. So I put Alvin Absolutely. Gentry and That's right. the great Archie Manning, Zach Street. Well, awesome. I'll, You're going to go right there. I'll gladly sign a ball with Archie Manning. Great One to have you. Hey, look at greats. this. We even have a thank you, Zach Streep. I don't think that was for uh. the show, but we're using it. All right. <laughs> so thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. And good luck with that media decision. Thank I know you the very beer, much. The product's fantastic. So well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it, listen, again, it's been a ton of fun. And uh, I've, I've had great fan feedback from it, which has been awesome. So I, I appreciate that feedback, and I hope I keep getting it. Well, there's a fine line between being persistent and a real pain in the butt. <laughs> And I know I was a little bit of both with no, you. No, 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 no. But, but I finally, it was fortuitous that I, the, the radio I'm, show happened. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm really glad I got to make it. So all right, all right. No, it's been me. fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of great saints on the show, and you're certainly in that category. Well, thank you. Appreciate, in fact, I think you're like my 10th offensive lineman. I had like all of them from the, from the 80s on nice. there. Hey, coming up next, though, we're going to have two of my favorite musicians in town. Derek Freeman, James Martin, these guys are a duo. They do a lot of bands together. They do a lot of things separately. One of my favorite soul brass band. They actually played uh, some second line at my aunt's funeral about a year ago. I can't thank them enough for that. And also later in the show, I have David Grubb, who is with Crescent City Sports. We're going to talk all about the Pelicans. This season's not over for them. We're figuring out what they're going to do with Boogie. And also, we're going to talk NBA playoffs. they got two series going. One's 2-1, two, one, one's 2-2. Two, two. At least we got some close series. We'll see what happens. And a little football stuff as well, including Billy Cannon. All that coming up next on Primetime Sports. The owners of the Delachaise Wine Bar on St. Charles Avenue have opened up their newest creation uptown on Maple Street called Chez Delachay, a new local wine bistro featuring a larger menu of small and large plates, a brighter atmosphere, and full table service. Additionally, patrons can enjoy a large patio out front as well as an extensive wine list offering selections from around the world. 
It's Chez Delachet, 7708 Maple Street, between Carrollton and Broadway. Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll at the city lane. Oh, my, let's roll, let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and roll. At Mid-City Lane's the home of rock and roll. Cayman is an all-natural alligator oil that treats anything concerning your skin from head to toe. Cayman oil is antibacterial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory, and helps with ailments, including burns, severe acne, athlete's foot and toe fungus. Cayman oil also helps with everyday issues such as healing cuts and scrapes, as well as spider and mosquito bites. It also does wonders quickly clearing up scars, dry scalp, psoriasis, and eczema. And it's made right here in Louisiana. More information is available online at caymanoil.com or amazon.com. Primetime Sports, and that was the Soul Brass Band. And two members are here today. They used to be, remember when I first started the show two years ago? They were part of our house band, and I'm so sad not to have them because our studio is a little bit smaller, so we can't. But they're doing some great things. The third year that the Soul Brass Band, I wanted to make sure I had it straight up, uh, has been together for, it, come September, and they've been, they're going to tour again all over Europe. They do this every summer. They tour together. They do some stuff separate on some separate projects. You have Derek Freeman and James Martin. Welcome back to the show. I've had you both on together yes. and individually. Thanks back. for having us again. And Great this is back. brand new. Let's <laughs> talk about this project first because mm -hmm. I'm so proud of what y'all have done. Obviously, before I met you, you're already big, but you're getting bigger and bigger. So let's start with you, Derek. What's this about? Um, it's just a representation of really all the music that we've been doing the last few years. Obviously, um, the record's called Soul because that's kind of the brand that me and James have associated ourselves with. But it's not necessarily a soul brass band record. There is brass band. The sure. soul brass band is on the record. Sure. But it features many other people, um, me and James, of course, and the great Kirk Joseph and uh, Nigel Hall and, you know, all the horn players from uh, Chris Royal to uh, Kid Chocolate to Michael Watson, on and on and on. Uh, our good friend Arson Delay. 40 different musicians I see Chris Royal, by the way, a lot on Facebook. He's, uh, he's active. He'll be with us in Europe this summer. So so tell me about that tour first, because I want to hear where you go, because you go to some exotic places. Yeah, well, it's, been, it's been fun. You know, the last four years, I've kind of been going, well, um, 14 and 15, I, oh, actually, I'm sorry. In 14, I went with Kermit Reference when I was still playing with him. Sure, sure. And then uh, um, 15 and 16, I kind of went solo as kind of like a guest artist. Nice. And kind of paved the way. And then the whole band went last year. Right. And now... Um, other members of the band are also going as guest artists. So we're just, just building it and Y'all go over. over here from Scotland all the way to Eastern Europe to so Turkey. So our first and, tour in about three yeah. weeks, we're going to um, Tel Aviv. We're playing jazz. Have you been there, by the way? No, we're it's, it's, I'm really so excited for, about it. Yeah, it's like South Beach in some areas. Yeah. I was shocked. I had a yeah, player the, the, the gigs are on the beach, so we're excited it's about phenomenal. that. It's phenomenal. We're going to You'll Tel Aviv. Be surprised if you've never seen it. No, I've never seen it. And then we're also going to Istanbul, which I have been before. I'm not sure. If I haven't been. I'm really looking forward to it. That's the first leg of the tour, and then. I'm fortunate enough to be able to come home <laughs> so for a couple can, of weeks in between. James, he'll tell you about it. I yeah. think he's going to. Um, so you're staying the whole time yeah. out there? Yeah, up, I, I have a few uh, few days in between Istanbul and Switzerland, so I'm just going to hang out there, <laughs> see the city by why myself. Not? I mean, why not? So you have a summer abroad, basically. <laughs> yeah, pretty and much. That's going to be fun. And then I, I go play with a Swiss artist in Switzerland, and then I uh, fly up to Copenhagen, Denmark, where I'm going to be doing, uh, I've assembled my own band of Danish musicians. This is my favorite it, shot so. of you. That's the glamour shot. Shot. Uh, we, we that's, had, that's the one that gets us all the geeks. <laughs> we have, yes, exactly, exactly, no doubt about it. I've, you're blowing up. I see you a lot of places. I mean, literally, oh, yeah. 
I'm hearing your name, and all of a sudden I turn the TV on. You're doing guest mm -hmm. appearances on uh, News with a Twist and all this other yeah. stuff. So been working how a lot is... with NCIS too. Yes, writing I some saw music that. I, th them. I sent you the picture, remember? Because I, yeah. I sent the one. I said, "Dude, you're on you're on NCIS right now." So congratulations. I know you've done a lot of stuff with mm -hmm. shows like Treme as well. Yeah, of course. But talk about what's happening with you. I mean, I know you had that great solo album. And I know you've had one before. What are you doing? You I know you were Soul Brass Band, but you, what are you doing in Europe this summer? Oh, well, uh, aside from playing in Switzerland with the Swiss artists and doing my own thing in Copenhagen, right. um, well, that, that's really a big step for me, um, to be able to put my own shows on and play my own music out there at the, the festival, the Fringe Festival in, in Copenhagen. So I'm really looking forward to that. And that's my next question, because I've always seen you since I've been back, which is five years, six years, with Derek and other bands, and you're playing that sax. But for the first time I saw you as a front man, I went to a show in the French Quarter, and mm -hmm. I was just stunned because I was like, you know, it's like that, that guy that's been sitting back on the, on the basketball team, and all of a sudden the three-pointer comes out, and he's just starring. So mm -hmm. this has been kind of meteoric, right? I mean, because you know you've had this talent, mm -hmm. but now everybody else is seeing it. Yeah, the last uh, few years since I've really, because I've been, like you said, a sideman for a lot of different groups, uh, Soul Brass Band included. Um, but in the last two years, I've really focused on my own project and my own band, and it's really just been very exponential. You know, each month, each goes by, I get more gigs. Uh, I'm doing a, a big show next month, uh, June fifteenth at Tipitina's, one of the Free Fridays. There so. you are, you're getting after it on that one. <laughs> oh, the Free Friday thing. Yeah, That's, those are amazing. Yeah, tell me about upcoming shows. By the way. You played with Kermit for many years, Kermit Robbins. You played with Trombone Shorty mm -hmm. for many years. But we're not talking about those guys because no. y'all are built your own thing up. Mm -hmm. You got your own brand. What's now. the thing about about the way I structured this band, Soul Brass Man? The whole band is made up of band leaders. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because I want that because well, one, they understand the game more, and also just because it brings more height to like every time James does a gig at a festival, it just heightens Soul Brass Band. Like I'm all, I'm you know I'm able to 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 ask for bigger you know, stages and, and more gigs because nice. we have all these great, you know, we have Kid Chocolate, who's a Grammy winning, yes. you know, band leader on his own. And Michael Watson, who has his own band, is an incredible voice, incredible musician. James is an incredible musician. You know, uh, I got our friend Tuba Danny Abel. I got those Tuba Steve out. I don't know how much he does, but I love that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tuba Steve won't be with it. Well, he might he'd be just doing some gigs with James, mm -hmm. but um, our good friend um, Doyle Cooper, little trumpet red who's oh, yeah. big trumpet red <laughs> yeah don't don't be traveling with us this summer so how many folks are gonna be on this tour for you? uh five five for the first one and then six for the second one so l less people than last year because we had to scale it down but y'all kind of you kind of mix and match sometimes because sometimes people are doing mm -hmm. their own thing i mean is that hard to do not i mean like i said it's been harder in years past because you have people that are designed just to be side men so they don't adjust as well. Sure. But like when you have a band full of band leaders, we can all interchange between each other. Parts parts can be some parts can be replaced. James is actually pretty hard to replace. <laughs> we try to do some gigs without him doing jazz fest. <laughs> it's and I was nice like, to, it's I was nice like, oh, to I really need that guy, so I can't really piss him off. But we'll try not to make sure that that's happening. It's happen. nice to be indispensable, right? Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Really, good. but we have a pretty uh, deep depth chart. We do, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I figured that out when y'all were in the house band. Some guy didn't show up, you can make another make call. call. Yeah, He's right. coming on over. 20, 20, 20 minutes. We got <laughs> exactly. 20 in music time, I found, is not really 20. No, but the important, <laughs> thing, I, the important <laughs> point I want to make, though, was about, like, about James doing his solo stuff um, this summer. Like, that's really important to me for, like, um, you know, a lot of band leaders. I'm not going to put anybody on the blast, but a lot of band leaders don't want to encourage yeah. right. their side men. No. Or to, to, and I'm, I've always been about that. I'm yeah. like, please sell your own CDs, sell your own merch. Buck your brand up, because like I said, it only influences it only my, better, my brand man. by having yeah. all these guys. Yeah, because you see, and they're like, oh my well, God, he's in this band too? Right. He's in this band too? Exactly. What mm -hmm. do they got going That's here? That's the effect we like to have when we walk in. They're like, this is an all-star band. And it's like really just my band, but it is also an all-star. It's like the Golden State Warriors. Like they're an all-star team, but they're actually really a team. Ain't no doubt. So that's what Soul Brass That's actually is. a great analogy, mm -hmm. by the way. Hey, when you were growing up here, I know you're from Texas originally, yeah. right? You, I want to know, who were your biggest band uh, brass band influences. Oh, Dirty Dozen, without a doubt. With ET Dirty and Dozen and Rebirth. and Rebirth. But also, um, New Birth doesn't get the credit they deserve. Uh -huh. And the Little mm -hmm. Rascals, who are I, sort of, I guess, defunct, they were a big influence of mine because they were those, all those guys were my age. So we were all 18, 19, 20, right, 21 right, right, years right, right. old together. I'm talking about Corey Henry, who everybody knows from the Treme Funk Tech. Sure. His band, The Little Rascals, were contemporaries of mine. So I, I learned most about his music from those guys. 
but you know the Uncle Lionel's and the. But now you're that guy. I mean, it's funny yeah, because it's you're, weird to think of it like that. But you yeah, are. You yeah. really are. And and, and, the, and the other thing, you you're a Rommel guy. You're a Noka guy. Mm-hmm. Tons of great talents come out of those places, particularly Noka in your field. Yes. Um, and now you're kind of the guy they're all looking up to. How does that feel? It's kind of strange. Seriously, <laughs> but it's true. we both still feel so young, yeah, right? It's, it's a right. new role. <laughs> It's like when people, you know, kids calling me unk. I'm the, like the younger yeah. generation oh, a- okay. asking I'm me questions. Right. So, well, yeah. I'm looking at the clock, and I wish I had more time. It's it's cutting down. But I, hey, Shays Delachaise, I think they'll let you use this at Delachaise yeah. as well. Enjoy. By the I way, those are good place. friends of mine, actually. Evan, Evan. Yeah. Evan's the guy. I went to college with him. He's great. This is the band right here. <laughs> this is the album. Uh, I don't have much time. I know people say record. I don't know what they call it anymore. There's not much vinyl out there, although it is coming back. But thank you once again, both of you guys. I love you guys. Thank you know I love you too, man. Appreciate and, it. Uh, and Scott. best of luck this summer. Yeah. I'm We're jealous because I can't usual. even get to Florida. I'm just like, <laughs> you guys are like. Oh, but look, can I sneak in? Uh, we have a few summer gigs, though. Quickly, we'll, we'll, be at, uh, we'll be at DBA July 6th. He won't because he'll be in Europe. Okay. July 6th. Right and then before. also August 31st. And I think we'll be at um, Blue Nile. Uh, right before we on June 16th. Anything the day coming we up right here, like before, like next two weeks? Blue Nile on the 16th. Blue Nile. Oh, on the 7th is our. I'm sorry, the 7th at DBA is our CD release party. June 7th. June 7th. June 7th at DBA. Yeah. I know we're going over, but we got that in. Yeah. Coming <laughs> up next, we got David Grove. We're going to talk Pels and NBA and some Billy Ken as well, right here on Primetime Sports. All right. Uh, welcome back to Primetime Sports. Got to thank my man, Zach Streif. And you just saw my two, two of my favorite musicians here in town, James Martin and Derek Freeman. And that was a clip from one of their bands, the Soul Brass Band. And by the way, you saw that Acme commercial? Go see my man, Cyrus the Shucker. He swore he, I wasn't going to say his name, but I go there all the time. I love it. Go get you some oysters from Cyrus. But right now I have a guest that has become one of the bigger basketball names in this town in just a short period of time. I got to give him credit. His name is David Grubb. This is his third appearance on Primetime Sports, and he is a beat writer for the Pelicans for Crescent City Sports. He covers the Pelicans and a lot of other stuff, but he's been everywhere lately. I see him on all kinds of news shows, hearing him on the radio, but here he is with us. We're going to kind of put a little bow on what's happening with the Pelicans. As you know, I had Alvin Gentry last week, and I got to start where I got to start, but first of all, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great. It's the third time, so hopefully this is the charm. (laughs) Always good to see you, brother. Wake Forest guy, yes. car graduate, also loves the game of basketball, play the game of basketball, and it's always good to talk to folks like you. So as far as Boogie Cousins, last week I asked Alvin Gentry, uh, is Boogie going to be back? And I didn't want to get too into mm-hmm. it, but I just he said we want him back. And I heard him reiterate that at the golf tournament yesterday with the Saints stuff, and he says we want him back. What is Boogie thinking in your mind? Well, today, Bleacher Report put out a story um, about a social media interaction. And obviously, over the last couple of weeks, that's been big about him un- unfollowing the Pelicans on right. Instagram and, and okay. things like that. Um, and basically, he liked a message that said the Pelicans should offer him a max contract. Oh, somebody put it out there. The, mm-hmm. Because other teams are obviously offering. Right. And they might not be the best teams. Right. And he's already been in a bad situation in Sacramento. So is it going to be a situation where he... He can make the most money and have to play on maybe a mediocre team, or is he going to maybe take less and play on a team that has a chance at least to advance far in the playoffs? You know, that's, that's interesting. If he's drawing a line in the sand at a, at a max deal, I can't see the Pelicans doing that unless it's a very you short explain term. Explain why, because I want people to know it's not as cut and dry the injury is a big part right. of it, and, and, and explain And the that. cap is the biggest part, yeah. and, and people really need to understand, and it's a hard thing to understand. Right. Um, and we've tried to do more of that. I think a lot of writers over the last couple of weeks have been trying to explain the cap more. The Pelicans are already right up against the hard cap. They have about $96 million of salary commitments for next year without Cousins, without Rondo. Uh, Rondo. Right. And uh, you're talking about they have four or five guys that they can who are – free agents, but they can retain if they'd like. Uh, guys like uh, Darius Miller, Emeka Okafor, who have roughly $2 million, $3 million holds. Sure. Um, the cap is hard at 101. The salary, the luxury tax begins at 123. If you give DeMarcus the max, which is around 30, you're at 126, which has already put you above the cap. The newfound love that Gail has for this team since her husband Tom died, and she was at every playoff game. She was in Portland. Uh, 
Del Demps privately has said the same thing to me, mm -hmm. and Alvin said on the show, she is into the team. Is she into it enough to pay that luxury tax? Because it's and tell people what luxury tax is and how much it is, because it's not cheap. No, you basically pay the league back dollar for dollar that you go over the cap. So you're doubling up those that money, and it's costing you. I mean, like if you if you every dollar you go over the cap, if you're one million over, you're paying the league two million dollars. Right. And like I said, just signing Demarcus puts you over, and they were over last year. So, so besides this them paying the million, you're paying two million more for every million. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's not. This is not an easy decision. No. But this, but the Pels are in a, like a kind of like they've never been in a situation in their 17 years where you feel they're on the cusp of doing something really special. And literally, I've said that Alvin is and and Del Dimps are between a hard place and a hard place. There is no rock because right, right, rocks right. can can be dissolved over funny. time. That's funny. It's just two hard places. Uh, you basically have a two year window here. Anthony Davis can opt out of his contract in two years because this season he's going to make All NBA, and that'll be his second time. It's called the Derrick Rose provision, right basically. On. So in so two he years, can opt out in two years, right? right. right. After the 2019 season. After that season. So, so, so the 18-19 season? No, the 1920 season. Okay, that's good. Okay, yeah, because you got me nervous. I was like, yeah. hold on. All right, one, one last thing before we mm -hmm. get off the top. If, if Boogie was not in New Orleans, what player would they get? Would they go for a three since they already kind of have a four in Meritage? What do you think they would do if Boogie wasn't here? The hard thing is how do you get that third player? How do you get that wing player that you need? Because, because you're right up against the cap, you're going to have to move somebody else. And who are your candidates to move? Alexis Agensa has a reasonable salary at five plus million, and he's in the last year of his deal. He's a candidate to get moved. Etwan Moore played great for the team, not a starting small forward, but he's your most att attractive option to move and maybe get some room to get a, a legitimate starting small forward. Who would be legitimate in your mind? The guys that I like, um, you know, people throw out names like Otto Porter and maybe we get Paul George. Those are impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you do a sign and trade and you're taking back Paul a lot George, of they're both impossible. You're right. right. But Otto Porter, you'd have to take a sign and trade. Right, and again, right, you're right. taking on money right. that's putting a you lot, at the a salary. A lot more tax. money than you need with that player. Right. So the guys that you look at for me, you're looking at more of those second tier players who are starters, who can do a role, play both ends. Um, I like a Gerald Green, maybe from Houston. A guy who can shoot the three ball, like is too. athletic, can play some I like defense, him too. And he good would be transition. for AD as yes. well. They run the court well together. Right, and that's what you're looking for. So yeah. it's got to be somebody who's athletic, long, even maybe bringing in Trevor Ariza back, who's at the an older part of his career. But again, still a, a great standstill still shooter, yeah. veteran presence, will know his role, won't be a problem in the locker room. So that's what you're looking for. Um, and, and this is also a good draft. Maybe in the second round you can find a, a wing who can help as a bench player because they do need to fill out that bench as well. I mean, you're talking about five holes on that bench. So this summer is going to be very interesting for the New Orleans Pelicans' future. Oh, yeah. It, no doubt. Deal and Dell will earn that name this summer. And I think Dell has done a much better job than some people give him credit. I know there's, there's, there's things that, that are legit, but mm -hmm. the guy brings in role players very well, and he mm -hmm. did it with Meritich. And, you know, Meritich... For a while, when I had your buddy Ali Cosell on, literally he had been bombing. I mean, right. literally only averaging like eight points in the previous and he 13. Was terrible but from the moment Ali was on, the next day <laughs> is when he shaved the beard and went nuts and all of a sudden became the guy that we couldn't lose. All right, moving forward, the NBA playoffs are in full swing, right in the smack middle of each conference final. LeBron tied it up last night. They looked like they were dead in the water. Mm -hmm. Boston is winning everything at home and losing everything on the road. They have home court advantage still. But will this momentum of LeBron push them over the Celtics? Or do you think the Celtics are going to grab it back when they get back to Beantown? Well, this is the first time really in these playoffs that the young Celtics have been tested yeah. by a team and a, particularly a player. But then again, Milwaukee took them seven. I mean, you True, know, but yeah. you know, those were two teams really feeling each other no out. Question. Two teams with not a lot of playoff experience. It felt more even. Right, you right. know, uh, uh, that group was learning. But now they're facing a juggernaut in LeBron James. A guy who has been in this position before, knows how to win, and is who there's is no match for him. LeBron James, I've heard of him. Who is this fellow you speak of? <laughs> oh, this guy here, right. LeBron <laughs> James. So, like, well, like you said, last night was his uh, seventh career playoff, uh, forty point game against the Celtics. That's great. And twenty two, thirty plus games against the Celtics in the playoffs. <laughs> That means you play the Celtics a lot in the playoffs, and you do pretty well against them. And for a guy we talked about beforehand, Al Horford, 
in his career is 3-15 and 15 against LeBron James in the playoffs. Hal Horford is one of the best <laughs> sneaky good players in NBA history. Mm-hmm. You look at his skill sets, like, what does he really do well? And all of a sudden, he's just killing it's you. Every, every, he's he does a little bit of everything. And, and he's a tremendous human being to boot. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a difficult series for the Celtics to pull off, obviously. Um, with Le- you never count LeBron out. This show, uh, obviously, is, is on Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. And... The Rockets will probably know in about four or five hours if they still are even going to have a chance in this right. playoff. They have a tall task ahead of them. They lost home court advantage uh, in game one. They did win one game going out west, but they got slaughtered by 41. Can they recover and give the Warriors a battle tonight? Because if they lose and go down 3-1, it could be curtains. The biggest problem for the Rockets against the Warriors is they play the exact type of style that right. the Warriors love defensively. The Rockets are a high dribble team. They run, they, they, uh, especially with Chris Paul and James Harden, they're guys who love to pound the basketball. They don't get into their sets early. Not a lot of player movement. So with a team is, uh, that can switch everything in and as long as the Warriors are, you're playing right into their hands. That blowout was not as much a result of maybe Steph Curry getting hot, but it was as much a part of the Rockets being terrible on offense. That one stat defense. after game one was astounding. James Harden had 550 dribbles. The big three for the Golden State Warriors, and I say big three, the two guards, Thompson and Curry, and Durant had a total of 549 between the three of them. They pound the ball over there in Houston for sure. Hey, I got to get on a little bit of football. Uh, Billy Cannon, a super legend. I know you've covered LSU right. as well. Uh, there's a lot of great backs in LSU history. I talked to one of them this morning, Jerry Stovall, who, by the way, will surprise you. He was second in the Heisman Trophy in 62. Right. Jim Taylor, the guy right before Billy Cannon, was an All-American Hall of Famer with the Packers. You've had tons of great ones ever since. I mean, Kevin Falk, one of my all-time favorites. Dalton Hilliard, the list goes on. Leonard Fournette, uh, Darius Geis, but there's tons of them. But they say Billy Cannon might be the greatest ever. Uh, what are your thoughts on this guy, this legend, in his career, uh, he obviously just passed well, away. Well, I think for those ago. folks, when you mention a name like Kevin Falk, yeah. Billy Cannon is the template for that. Right. An all-purpose guy, right. caught the ball, ran the ball, did everything from that position. And then he also was a two-way player, so he played defensive back for that team as well. Kick, punted sometimes. Right, and one of the few, you know, you, you talk about that elite class of guys who won, you know, multiple SEC Player of the Year awards and his pro career. Those are things that have kind of been lost over time. And I think that respect for his, his history, the, all the great things he did, both at LSU and as a pro, you know, they tend to get overshadowed. And, and that's the problem with sports is that we forget those guys who really created the template for what LSU football is today. And his pro career is better than most people give him credit for. He, it was shortened by injury, but he did still have like almost 70 touchdowns. And he has the most touchdown receptions by a back in AFL NFL history and a two-time MVP nine of championship games and nine touchdowns yeah two-time MVP I mean he was he was spectacular only one of six players to be the player of the year in the SEC twice so we got to give him his due Billy Cannon was truly a great even though he's way before all of our time right. pretty much watching this show by the way you're ahead of your time you're doing great things you're going to be on the ball I can't believe it you're going to get right here next to the mailman Carl Malone oh, sign oh. wherever you want dude you've earned it David Grubb Right there, I appreciate it. i got to thank my other guests, Derek Freeman and James Martin, and, of course, Zach Streif. i got to thank my producer, Will Hill, Redhead Tsunami, Naila does such a fantastic job, Anthony Alonzi, love him, does great work, and everybody over at CST and WLE, I am fortunate to have such wonderful people to work with. i got to thank you. We'll see you next week. This guest list is getting bigger and bigger, and it's going to be all summer long. So stay tuned right here on Primetime Sports.